Hey guys, good afternoon. Thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is Megan Henry. I just want to jump on real quick to go over a few things with you before we actually begin the webinar. We'd like to start by thanking our host, CanTime, an enterprise software solution for all providers in the post-acute healthcare industry, as well as our sponsors, HealthRev Partners, where revenue cycle management meets true partnership, and Playmaker Health, where CRM and data become a powerful resource. Before we begin, I just want to go over a few items so you guys know how to participate in today's event. The handout for today's webinar was sent in your reminder email, and you should also be able to get it from within chat shortly. We want you guys to ask questions during the webinar, and John is going to try to answer as many as he can at the end. However, it is a jam-packed presentation. Please go ahead and send us those questions. If we don't get to your question at the end, we will send out a Q&A document after the webinar as well. To ask a question, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can also click the chat bubble to chat with us. So I'd love to try the chat out with everybody. Why don't you go ahead and click chat, tell me where you're from and share with us your favorite movie. I'd love to hear that. Looks like we've got Thomas from California, got another Thomas from Ohio, and he loves Pulp Fiction. Veronica from Laredo, favorite movie is The Notebook. Love that movie, Veronica. Tracy, Cedar Valley Hospice, Wizard of Oz. Yes, that is also one of my favorites. We've got Candy from North Carolina and from Virginia. Lillian from Minnesota. So we've got a lot of people from all over the place. We really appreciate you guys joining us. Going to go on mute for just a second, and we're going to go ahead and start at the top of the hour. Thanks, everybody. Alrighty, we still got a couple people joining, but let's go ahead and get started. I know that John has got a lot to share with you. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce to you today's presenter. John Reisinger is the principal of Innovative Financial Solutions for Home Health and is a CPA that specializes exclusively in the home health industry. Working in home health since 1992, John has held various roles, including Medicare Auditor, as well as VP of Reimbursement for a large multi-state home health organization. He established his consulting company back in 2008, and since then has been leading the charge to bring back financial fundamentals to home health. John is also, oh, sorry, John also licensed the industry's first patient budgeting tool called the Home Health Care Resource Planner. It's a web-based app that can enhance your profit potential while enabling you to provide top of the line care. All right, John, I'm turning the webinar over to you. Hey, thank you, Megan. And I wanna welcome everybody to our presentation today. And as Megan noted, it's a jam-packed presentation. So let's hit the ground running. But before we start the presentation, I have a couple of poll questions for you. So I'm going to ask that you respond to these poll questions fairly quickly, you know, within 30, 30 or so seconds, 30 seconds. Now, like at about 45 seconds in, I want to give the responses that we have. So the first one is, is the Medicare home health cost report really important? You know, and your, your, your options are no, it's just a regulatory hoop we must jump through annually. Second one is no, it provides no value to the agency or the program. Third is yes, but the reasons why are unclear. 
And the last one is yes, it is used to set annual payment rates. So if everybody could just give me a response, what is the type of response? What is your thought? What is the common thought that you hear uh, regarding this? Okay, Kristen, I think we could go ahead and pop what's the response that we got on there. So the majority of you identified correctly that it's yes, it is used to set the annual payment rates for the industry. A significant number said yes, but the reasons why are unclear, a common answer out there. Uh, but I will tell you in my 20 plus years of being on this side of the fence, not being because my first five years I was a Medicare auditor, but you know, over the last 25 plus years, I've been over on this side of the fence. And I can tell you, that the vast majority of answers that I have heard to this over the years have been the, one of the first two. No, it's a regulatory hoop or no, it provides no value. So let's move on to the second poll question. And that is, what basis of accounting is acceptable for preparing the cost report? So we have the cash basis and that you recognize revenues as cash is received and expenses as cash is dispersed, the accrual basis, which is recognize revenues as they are earned and expenses as they are incurred. So it's divested from the receipt or disbursement of cash. A cash hybrid basis, which is basically A, but for those agencies that have large medical supply inventories that they can use a FIFO or a LIFO method with that. D, all of the above, meaning that whatever financial, whatever basis of accounting you keep your financial records on, you can submit your cost report on. Or the last answer is E, none of the above, meaning Medicare CMS has its own specific accounting basis that we have to comply with. So again, I'll give you another 25, 30 seconds to respond to that. And it's not being graded, so I'd appreciate it if everybody would submit answers. We can't see who's submitting what. All right, Kristen, let's go ahead and see the results of that. So we have 6% at the cash basis, 40% at the accrual basis, 2% at the cash hybrid, 48% saying whatever basis we keep our records in, and 4% say none of the above. Medicare is, has its own prescribed accounting basis we have to follow. So the answer is, and this comes from the provider reimbursement manual, which are the instructions that we have to comply with. We're looking at what's highlighted and it says the cost data must be based on an approved method of cost finding and on the accrual basis of accounting. So 40% got that right, meaning 60% got that wrong. I'm not picking on anybody. I just want everybody to understand that that's the one of the big unknowns in the industry, that most of the industry does not know that the cost report has to be prepared under the accrual basis of accounting. From another section of the provider reimbursement manual, talking about accounting basis specifically, it says the cost data submitted must be based on the accrual basis of accounting, which is recognized as the most accurate basis for determining costs. So then the question at the bottom begets, what if an agency keeps its financials on the cash basis? Well, the answer is really simple. You have to convert your financials to the accrual basis. That's a fairly complicated process. Um, going back from the accrual basis to the cash basis is much easier. And if you kept your, your business financials under the accrual basis, you could convert to the cash basis for the tax returns. And that's why most agencies do keep their financials under the cash basis is because when those organizations started up, they worked with an accountant, even a CPA, but they worked with an accountant or CPA that did not understand the needs of the cost report requirement 
or more importantly, the needs of the information the agency has to be able to best manage their operations. So my recommendation is everybody should be under the accrual basis of accounting. Okay, and then when you do your taxes, you can convert to the cash basis. It's very easy to do. But I would also say that most of the accountants and CPAs that put you on the cash basis of accounting to begin with, if you need to convert your financials to the accrual basis of accounting for the cost report, they're probably not gonna be very good at it because they don't understand the industry well enough. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the cost report, the new changes to the cost report, and that's form 1728-20. What we used last year was 172894. So this is the first major change in over 25 years. There was a small change back in 2016, and that's where the PRQ was replaced, the Provider Reimbursement Questionnaire. And that was an 11 to 13 page document that was applicable to hospitals. But for us at Home Health, 80% of it was not applicable. So they replaced that entire questionnaire with a one page worksheet in the cost report. And in addition to that, on that worksheet in the cost report. They added a section for identification of the cost report prepare. Now, although the cost report is a flawed document, it is a required filing for all organizations participating in the Medicare program. And the Medicare cost report, like a tax return, is a pre-formatted presentation of your financial, operational, statistical, and general administrative information. Now, usually I would discuss the various worksheets in the cost report, talking about what's included in each series in general, talking about the strengths and weaknesses of each of those series, and then what's in, what worksheets are specifically included within that series and the strengths and or weaknesses of each worksheet. This year, I'm gonna be doing something similar I'm just gonna be focusing more on the changes that are occurring with the cost report this year, as opposed to really looking at the strengths and weaknesses of the cost report or the worksheets in general. Now, a couple of points before we get too far into this presentation. This webinar is not intended to prepare you to become a cost report preparer, because I do not believe that this is something that you can adequately learn to do in a couple of webinars, seminars, even six plus months of study. Although there are some consultants out there that will gladly take your money to tell you that they can teach you in a couple of webinars or seminars how to do a cost report, okay? That is false, okay? This takes years of training and oversight because of all the rules and regulations you need to know to be able to prepare a cost report properly. And the PRM, the Provider Reimbursement Manual, where the instructions are, if you go through those instructions with a ruler, they're still not going to really help you complete the cost report. You need to understand the regulations otherwise. Similar to a tax return where you need to know and understand the tax laws and regulations, the cost report is a very complex document and if not completed properly, tends to be detrimental to future home health reimbursement and importantly, subjects the owners and officers of the agency to significant liabilities and penalties, including jail time. So the cost report preparer is basically your last line of defense to protect you from something that could jump out and be wrong for which you could be subject to those significant liabilities and penalties, including jail time. It's your future, it's your agency's future, it's the industry's future. It's saving a few bucks to find the cheapest prepare worth the risk. Okay, now throughout this presentation, I'm gonna be discussing the various worksheet series that make up the cost report. And those include the S series made up of worksheets S, S2 and S3, the A series with worksheets A, A6, A8 and A81, the B series with worksheets B and B1, Worksheet C, the D series with worksheets D and D1, and lastly, the F series with worksheets F and F1. Now, for most of the worksheet series descriptions to follow, I will follow that worksheet with an addendum. Okay, now the addendum will be the actual instructions from the provider reimbursement manual for that worksheet. I will identify any changes or additions to the applicable worksheets. However, I generally will not spend a lot of time on the instructions, but I will point out some of the more complex or misunderstood instructions as I have identified over the years. So now let's get into the meat and potatoes of the cost report. First, we're gonna take a look at worksheet S. 
Worksheet S is the front page of the cost report, more commonly known as the certification page. So we see in the center here, this is where the, the CFO or the administrator puts their signature. And over to the right, you know, it says that they're, they have read and agreed with the certification statements above. So I want to point out the certification statements above because the majority of people I start working with, they really never paid attention to these. And these are very important. In fact, the top one is really important. And that's why it's all in caps. Okay. And it reads, misrepresentation or falsification of any information contained in this cost report may be punishable by criminal, civil, and administrative action, fine, and or imprisonment under federal law. Furthermore, if services identified in this report were provided or procured through the payment directly or indirectly of a kickback or were otherwise illegal, criminal, civil, and administrative action fines and or imprisonment may result. So there's a lot of liabilities that exist with these and there are plenty of people in the jails in the prison system today to attest to that. We go down to the bottom certification statement after it's and ending 1231.20 and it reads, and that to the best of my knowledge and belief, this report and statement are true, correct, complete, and prepared from the books and records of the provider in accordance with applicable instructions except as noted. If you don't send an attachment saying we deviated from the instructions, it implicitly means that you have followed the provider reimbursement manual and cost report instructions exactly. It goes on further to say the last sentence, I further certify that I am familiar with the laws and regulations regarding the provision of healthcare services and that the services identified in the cost report were provided in compliance with such laws and regulations. So there's a lot of liability there in that little statement. So you want to make sure that the information in your cost report is as accurate and complete as you can make it. And your cost report preparer is somebody that can help you in that cause. Now we're going to go to the next worksheet, worksheet S2. Here we're looking at the top part, part one, the top part of part one of worksheet S2. Now this worksheet, I just have the top part of it. I don't have the bottom part of it for you to see. It's mostly administrative and demographic, pretty much the same as what it's been for years. Um, but I did want to point out line 11. Line 11 is talking about related party costs. And this is a big issue, related party transactions. This is a big issue because this is often misreported, underreported. We'll talk about that soon. But remember, this is the first time we had the question about related parties. Okay, so notice that the top of this page says addendum. So whenever you see the top of the page say addendum, underneath it are the instructions for the worksheet that we're discussing. So here are the instructions for worksheet S2 part one. Okay, now we're going to go to worksheet S2 part two. Worksheet S2 part two is that document that I noted earlier that replaced the old PRQ, the provider reimbursement questionnaire. There are four sections in here that are in lieu of the old provider reimbursement questionnaire. We see the first three of them here. We have three questions regarding the provider organization and operation. Question number three. Question number three here is once again, asking about related party transactions. Are there transactions with organizations that would be deemed related parties? So after two sheets, two worksheets, three worksheets in, we already have two questions about related party issues. Okay, there's nothing wrong with related party issues. The whole key to related party issues is making sure you uh, identify them and report them properly. The second, section has two questions about financial data and reports. And the third section has three questions about bad debt. So depending on how you answer the questions over to the left with a yes or a no is going to dictate whether you have to put additional information over in the columns to the right, the second and third columns. Here are the instructions for completing the top of part two, worksheet S2 part two. Here's the bottom half of worksheet S2 part two. 
at the top, we have six questions with the PSNR report data. This is the fourth section that is in lieu of the old PRQ that we have to deal with. And then underneath, we have the cost report prepare contact information. Okay, and I have a note down there that says the bottom is for the cost report prepare information because I've had a couple of clients over the last handful of years come to me and when I went through the cost report with them, what we were doing, what we had to do, they informed me that their cost report prepare told them that it was supposed to be the primary contact for the home health agency, not the person that prepared the cost report, even though the section says cost report prepare contact information. And that's absolutely wrong. So here are the instructions for the first six questions that were under the PSNR. Here are the instructions that were for the cost report prepare. And it's saying cost report prepare, cost report prepare, cost report prepare. It's not talking about the main contact for the home health agency. So if the person that prepares your cost report is an employee of your organization, you put that employee's name and contact information there. If you get an outside person such as myself to prepare your cost report, then it would be that person's, for example, mine, that would be going in there. Okay, next we're gonna take a look at Worksheet S3. Now Worksheet S3 has five parts. Four are very similar to what we have been using since the inception of PPS. Few of them have, do have some changes. Um, and part five is brand new. Okay, so this top first part of the instructions is just general instructions about Worksheet S3 in general. Um, the bottom portion we see where it's talking about HHA visits. Now that is not home health aid, that is home health agency visits, okay? What we're getting at here is identifying Medicare like kind visits. So what is the difference between Medicare like kind visits and non like kind visits? Medicare like kind visits are reported on work sheet S3 part one in lines one through nine, which we will see shortly over in columns one, three, or five versus all other services, Medicare non-like kind services are reported and are only reported on line 10 of column five. So general criteria for visits to be considered like kind. Now the big picture, the 30,000 foot perspective of when you're looking at Medicare like kind versus non like kind, okay, is when you're dealing with a non Medicare payer, because if it's a Medicare visit, it's Medicare like kind. If you're doing with a, dealing with a non Medicare payer, then the question you ask yourself is if I was doing this exact same visit for Medicare, would Medicare pay for it? Generally speaking, if the answer is yes, it's Medicare like kind, so it gets reported in lines one through nine in the applicable column. If the answer is no, then it gets reported in line 10, column five. The criteria, the first one is homebound. And this one always holds true for home health, or I mean for Medicare and Medicaid, although the, the, you know, the restrictions have been loosened up a little bit during this, this public health emergency, um, but homebound. But that's applicable for Medicare and Medicaid. The commercial payers, Advantage Care plans, they don't have to hold their patients to the homebound status. If everything else holds true, then it's a Medicare like kind visit. The patient must be under the care of a physician and the services are provided while the patient is under a plan of care. You're following the plan of care that the physician authorized. There is a need for intermittent skilled care at least initially, it being skilled nursing, PT, or speech. And once those drop off, you can continue with OT. And lastly, the services are provided by a participating, meaning a Medicare certified home health agency. If you answer yes to all those, it's gonna be a like kind visit. So here are some additional instructions, general instructions where it's talking about patient census, unduplicated census, um, so now we're going to take a look at S3 part one, and this is for the visits that are performed this year. In some sections of the cost report, like here, 
we're identifying visits that were done this year. In other sections of the cost report, we're gonna be looking at visits that were associated with episodes that ended this year. Meaning there could be some visits in there from December, 2019 that are applicable to episodes that ended in 2020. So they're being counted in this year's cost report. Conversely, there's, there's visits that were done in December 2020 that because they're applicable to episodes that ended in December and January 2021, they're not included in the 2020 cost report. Okay, so the big change here are rows one through six, okay, because we look at lines one and two, we have skilled nursing, but line one is for RN, line two is for LPN, and for those states that use LVN instead of LPN, I apologize, but this is how Medicare did put it out. Um, so historically, we just had one line for skilled nursing, now we have two, RN and LPN. Lines three and four, we have PT and PTA, where historically it was all lumped under PT, and we have lines five and six for OT and COTA, where again, historically, it was just OT. And columns three and four, we now have to separately identify Medicaid visits and patients. Historically, Medicaid was included in other. Now, when we're looking at, and if you look at lines one through nine, so that goes skilled nursing care RN down to home health A. Those are all your Medicare like kind visits. Line 10, all other services, these are your Medicare non-like kind services. You move to the right, you see you can't put any information in columns one, two, three, or four. The only place you can put information is in columns five and six. And when it comes to Medicare and Medicaid, it's just the traditional fee for service variety, not the Advantage plans. Medicare Advantage plans and Medicaid Advantage plans are considered other. And keep in mind that CMS does have the breakdown of your RN and LPN, your PT and your PTA, and your OT and COTA visits. So thinking that you're just going to throw everything in skilled nursing because that's all you've ever done may not be such a good idea because that's going to be one of the things that's going to have you stand out. Okay, it's going to make you no longer blend into the woodwork, which is what you want to do with everything that you possibly can. You don't wanna draw scrutiny upon your agency, okay? And here are the instructions for S3 part one, columns one through eight. And then here are the lines, the instructions for lines one through 13. So that's gonna take us to worksheet S3 parts two and three. Now I wanna do this one a little bit backwards because I wanna start at the bottom of this and look at part three, then we'll come back to part two. And the reason I wanna do this is part three is exactly the same as what it was last year. There's absolutely no change here at all. Okay, so I don't wanna spend much time here. In column 34, you identify the number of CBSA service areas you operate in. In line 35 and below, you identify the CBSA service area codes that you operate in, okay? So if you put in four CBSA service areas you operate in, in line 34, there's gonna be the expectation that you're gonna have line, a CBSA code in line 35, a, 30, a, lot, a code in 35.01, a code in 35.02, and a code in 35.03. Okay, where the changes are, are up above in part two with the FTEs, full-time equivalents. Okay, now this starts out with line number 14. First thing you have to identify is, what's the number of hours in your normal work week? Most agencies, it's gonna be 40. Some may use 35 or even 37 and a half, okay? So this is the big difference from last year and partly why I included it here. It's because of the additional level of detail required this year that historically has not been required. For example, in lines 19 and 20, we have a breakout of RN in line 19. In line 20, we have LPN slash LVN, okay, where historically it was all just skilled nursing. In lines 22 and 23, we have PT and PTAs. And in lines 25 and 26, we have OTs and COTAs. Now, the one thing I want you to remember is visits. If you have visits, LPN, LVN, PTA, COTA, visits, on worksheet S3, then that's gonna mean that there are staff providing those visits, 
So the expectation is, is there's going to be FTEs for those same disciplines here. And then when we get over to worksheet A, there's gonna be costs associated with that. These are the relationships that exist that you can get away with submitting your cost report without necessarily having these relationships identified. But that's the kind of thing that makes you stand out from the crowd. And when it comes to having the max wanted to do a deep dive in your cost report, that's something that most people would rather avoid. Um, and additionally, part two has historically been poorly prepared because with the information we have in worksheet S3 part one, our S3 part two part one and worksheet S3 part two, we can calculate, we can extrapolate what the expected, what the average visits per FTE per week is by discipline meaning how many RN visits do, how many visits do your average RN staff do per week? Okay, and that's simply by taking the RN visits from worksheet S3 part one, divide that by the total FTEs that you have for RN, and that gives you visits per the year, average visits per FTE per year. Divide that number by 52, and that gives you average RN visits per FTE per week. And most agencies are going to have an expected range that's going to be somewhere in the 18 to 25 range, 18 to 25 visits per week. Uh, and that's going to be dependent on, you know, whether they're doing opens, uh, what kind of additional work they may have on their plate. But I will tell you in the high volume disciplines like skilled nursing and PT, I have seen that average vary anywhere from having the average RN doing 400 visits, over 400 visits per week, which I imagine that person hopes that they're paid on a per visit basis, compared to an RN, you know, the average RN visits per week for FTE being less than 0.1. And those extremes are ridiculous because RN is one of those high discipline visits that just about everybody does so that number should be in right in or right around that 18 to 25 range ballpark. So this has historically been prepared. So this, this is gonna sort of tie into why we have part five of worksheet S3, which we will see shortly. Here are the instructions for completing worksheet S3 part two. Now I include the instructions, although as you go through the instructions, it's not even, the instructions are not even as good as a tax return because the tax return instructions are pretty good that you could take a ruler and go line by line by line and sort of address how to prepare the tax return. Not entirely, but pretty well. The cost report doesn't work like that anywhere near as well. Okay, so the top part of these instructions here are the instructions for the FTEs. And I have this note down here. It says the calculations should be based on hours worked and paid, not just hours paid, because your salaried staff are paid. Let's take an example of a 40 hour work week. Okay, so your salaried staff are paid based on a 40 hour work week. Okay, but in an example, there are plenty of administrators, it could be any employee, I'm using the administrator in this example, uh, that works on average 50 hours a week. So their FTE count shouldn't be one because there's one individual there and they're paid for 40 hours a week. This individual's FTE count should equate to 1.25. And that calculation would be the 50 hours that they work per week divided by the 40, which is the average out, the, the hours expected for a full-time employee, 1.25. Then we have the instructions for part three, but I additionally put that note in here that we have RN and LPN visits. We should also have RN and LPN FTEs and costs. Having one without the other could get your cost report rejected, maybe even 18 plus months after submitted, meaning your cost report could be initially accepted. And then later on down the road, it could be rejected something you really don't want to have because again, that's the kind of thing that makes you stand out. Now we're going to take a look at worksheet S3 part four. Again, this is basically the same thing as what we had in years past. One thing I want to point out is look at lines one and two. We have skilled nursing visits, skilled nursing charges. We do not have the breakdown that we've been seeing everywhere else and we will see everywhere else. 
This is the one place where they just stayed with skilled nursing with PT and with OT. They didn't go for the additional detail. The only other, the only real change that took place on this worksheet is there's two columns that used to exist in between what we see now is column four and five. Those two columns were applicable to SCICs. SCICs no longer exist. That's so they just eliminated that for presentation purposes. And here are the instructions for completing uh, that part four. So now we're going to take a look at the new worksheet, worksheet S3 part five. Okay. This schedule is as a supplement to worksheet S3 part two, because remember worksheet S3 part two is for our FTEs. So over in column four, we're going to be identifying and identifying the paid hours related to the compensation that's going to be identified over in columns one and two. Okay. And this worksheet provides for the collection of home health direct care expenditures. So it's direct care. It's talking about the staff that put their hands on the patient, okay? So, or, or the nursing supervisor, okay? So in column one, we're gonna be putting in what the salaries, all the various compensation, holiday pay, overtime pay, et cetera, in there. In column two, we're gonna have fringe benefits. Now you see there's only fringe benefits in rows one through 13. And that's because one through 13 are our employees our W-2 staff. Lines 14 through 26 are our contracted staff, our 1099 staff, not employees. So those people do not get in fringe benefits. So we're gonna add columns one and two to get adjusted salaries in column three. We're gonna put in the paid hours related to the salary. And over in column five, we're gonna divide column three by column four to get an average hourly wage. The potential use for this is to also, one, to help justify the FTEs that are identified on uh, S3 part two, but also it could become the basis for helping to create a home house specific wage index, which we in the industry have been clamoring for for decades, not years, decades, because it has been decades because we are subject to the hospital wage index, and it has been de decades since the hospital wage index has been fairly representative of what labor costs are for us in home health. Here are the instructions for completing that. It's just the five columns. So now we're going to take a look at the worksheet A series. The A series has to do with costs. Okay, so this is the top portion of the worksheet A. And over in column, the left-hand column, well, the third column to the left, it says cost center descriptions. So these are cost centers that everybody should have in their financial system and in their EMR. So now we need to have a breakout of RN and LPN between PT and PTA, between OT and COTA, where historically we didn't necessarily need it. I think most EMRs had the ability to break that out for years, if not decades, but you know, not everybody did that. Now there's many new cost centers included here. And when we get to the instructions, I'll start pointing those out. And then this is the bottom of worksheet A. Oh, let me digress a moment. So we have four sections in the worksheet A of the cost report. Lines one through eight are in the general service cost centers. The general service cost centers are more commonly known as admin and general cost centers, A and G cost centers. Some people flip that around and call them G and A. Okay, but those are the costs that get allocated to the cost centers identified and used throughout the course of the year in the other three sections. Okay, the next section underneath that is the HHA reimbursable services cost centers. So to the extent that we can, we wanna have all the costs up in the lines one through eight, funnel down into these lines because it's these lines that get included in the cost calculations for Medicare, determining Medicare costs, okay? And the more costs we get in here, the better it's gonna look because the cost report does a very poor job of identifying Medicare costs and historically significantly, if not grossly overstates our profitability in Medicare, which is a drag on our reimbursement. Okay, 
Then we go to the bottom half of worksheet A, and we have the final two sections. Lines 39 through 49 is for the non-reimbursable services. And uh, the last line 57 is for the last section, the special purpose cost center. Okay, now one thing I do wanna point out is line 48 here. Line 48, we have advertising here. So this is not allowable advertising. So the cost that you put down here in these non-reimbursable or special purpose cost centers, not only does that cost not go into the Medicare calculation, but it also makes part of the general service cost, the costs up in line one through eight, a portion of those costs come down here, meaning they don't go up into the Medicare reimbursable areas. Okay, so to the extent that we can not put costs in here, that's great. If you, if you have services that you need to, that's fine. Okay, but we just don't want to artificially take away costs from the Medicare calculation. Advertising is here. It's also on worksheet A8. And I'm gonna bring, bring that up when we get to A8. Here are the instructions for worksheet A, general instructions. And then we get into columns one, two, three, and then we have columns four through 10. Then the instructions for lines one through five. Here in line five, we see new CC. New CC stands for new cost center. Line five is telecommunication technology. This is the new cost center in which we're able to put these types of costs, telecommunication costs, and treat them as an allowable admin cost. Okay, where historically, even if these costs, these services completely benefited the patient, we always had to treat them as a non-allowable, non-reimbursable cost center cost. So not only did they detract some of, you know, these were Medicare, they should have been Medicare costs that we couldn't count as Medicare costs. They even created a non-reimbursable cost center, which pulled administrative, general administrative costs down to them. So it didn't go into the Medicare cost calculation to begin with. So it was sort of a double whammy. So here we get to start including telecommunication technology costs in here. But one thing I wanna point out is take a look at the last sentence in that section. Do not report telehealth services on this line because telehealth services are different than telecommunication technology and telehealth services are still deemed a non-allowable cost center cost. We'll see that when we get down further. Okay, we have three more new cost centers here. Line seven, nursing administration, line eight, medical records, and line nine. Line nine is a general service cost, is for any general service cost center that's not identified up in the first eight lines. So you have to specifically identify that. I don't think many agencies are gonna be using this at all. So, but it's there for future growth. Okay, then we get into the reimbursable services. So these first six lines are new cost centers because we now break out skilled nursing costs between line 16 for registered nurses and line 17 LPNs. Same thing for PT. Now PT is broken out line 18 for physical therapy and line 19 PTAs. And line 20 is for OT and line 21 is for COTAs. Okay, then we get down a little bit and these are continuing from what we've always used in the past. Then we come down a little bit more and we have a couple more, one new section and one for future growth. Uh, line 29 is new cost center is disposable devices. And this is primarily for negative pressure wound therapy devices, the one and done use. And line 30 is for any other reimbursable services not identified in line 16 through 29. Then we get into the non-reimbursable sections. Okay, so these initially are cost centers that we've always used and had available to us in the past, but we have some new ones here. So line 47 is telehealth. This is distinct and different from telecommunication technology. Line 48 is advertising, okay? So remember that line 48 advertising is also on worksheet eight and I'll point it out when we get there. Line 49 is for fundraising. That's primarily gonna be for not-for-profits. And line 50 is for any non-reimbursable services not identified in lines 39 through 49. And then the last section is our special purpose cost centers. We only have one and that's line 57 for hospice. Line 48 is for any others that you know, are not identified above. We used to have four more, uh, but they were eliminated for this cost report. And that was the core CMHC, RHC, and the FQHC. But those have all been eliminated. 
So now we're going to go to worksheet A6. A6 is basically a continuation of the same worksheet that we've used in the past. Okay, this really hasn't changed. Uh, the only thing that makes it a bit, there's a couple of things that make it a bit confusing. One, the increases must always equal the decreases. Whatever you're taking out of one place or a number of places has to go back in someplace else. So the net impact to the financials is zero. And that's for reclassification. Um, this is common for those agencies that have a non-home house specific account and CPA uh, working with them where they're likely to have just one line for salaries and wages. Okay, and as we've seen, that is just unacceptable for doing a cost report, let alone trying to figure out how to run your business. Okay, I'd say even more importantly for trying to figure out how to run your business, you need to have the detail to be able to manage your business. Okay, so if you have one line item for salaries and wages for everything, then a portion of that salary and wages should be up in admin in general, but a portion of that salary and wage should be in skilled nursing, should be, in, you know, should be an RN, LPN, PT, PTA, et cetera. So what you need to do is you need to reclass the portion that goes over into RN, LPN, PT, PTA, et cetera. Whatever that to title totals, then that's the amount that you have to subtract out from your A and G salaries so that they net to zero. And here are the instructions for worksheet A6. Now these instructions, they're what are provided in the PRM, but they're gonna be of limited use when you're really trying to go through the lines and see what's going on in the cost report. Now we go to worksheet A8. Okay, A8 is for the adjustment of expenses. Okay, any and all adjustments should be identified here. Now they can increase the expenses as reported in your trial balance, or they can be a decrease to the expenses as reported in your trial balance. You know, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, they're gonna be a decrease to the expenses uh, as identified in your trial balance. What I wanted to point out here is line 11. Here again, we have advertising costs. So to the extent we can legitimately do it, I would put non-allowable advertising costs here so they just disappear from our cost calculations on the cost report, as opposed to working them, putting them over in worksheet A as a non-reimbursable cost center, because then they're gonna take a portion of the overhead allocation away from what would other, otherwise go to the Medicare calculation. Here are the instructions for A8. Now we're gonna look at worksheet A81. This is a big one because this is what I was harping on earlier about related party transactions. And I do want to say that there is absolutely nothing wrong with related party transactions. In fact, when I went from being a Medicare auditor to coming over onto this side of the fence and working in the industry, okay? That was one of the things I pushed for, for the organization that I was with because we were successful, we were growing and we decided, you know, I talked to the ownership and convinced them that it was better for us to create a, a, another company that would be a real estate company that would own and develop real estate. And then we would get our agencies to lease space in these buildings that we purchased. So the agencies would pay the bills for these buildings that we were building equity on. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with related party transactions. It's just identifying and reporting them properly. So here on this worksheet, we're identifying the cost of related party transactions. For example, if you did have related party rent, if you had one office that you rented and you paid monthly rent for that from to a related party, you wouldn't have to show 12 lines of information. You could just show one, identify it in column three as rent expense, and then put in the applicable information uh, over in the columns to the right. And I bring this up because we want to remember that on the first three worksheets, we already had two questions about related party costs. Okay, pretty significant issues. We had question 11 on worksheet S2 part one, and we had question three on worksheet S2 part two. And we briefly looked at both of those and I said I was gonna bring them up and there I just did. 
So this is identifying what the costs are for these related party transactions. And here we have the instructions. One thing I wanna point out is agencies have, the been, have been forced to close for under or not reporting these costs. And I know that for a fact because as a Medicare auditor back in the day, I closed several agencies because of this, because agencies would play shenanigans where they would have these non-disclosed related parties and they would funnel costs from these non-disclosed related parties over into the Medicare agency to get the Medicare agency to cover it, okay? And then it would make these non-disclosed related parties look more profitable. I identified that and well, those agencies got closed down and had significant fines. And I think there were a couple of people actually got to spend a little time in jail because of that. So it's a significant, a big significant issue. Okay, so here are the instructions for what to do on part one, columns one through eight. Then we get to part two of A81. And this is talking about the interrelationship. What is it that creates the related party situation? And I have, a, you know, in the note below, I say there are a lot of different ways related party relationships can arise. And we can look over at the bottom left-hand side of the screen and see the codes A through G. So A through F, CMS has identified various ways in which a related party transaction can occur. There's other ways in G that we would have to identify what the specific issue is. So there are ways that a related party situation can arise in which there is no common ownership, okay? So you don't have to have common ownership for there to be a re related party scenario to exist. Okay, and here are the instructions for part two. Now we go over into the B series and the B series is about the cost allocation series, how we're gonna allocate the cost. Remember, we're gonna take the information, the values from lines one through eight, the general service cost centers, and we're gonna allocate them to the various cost centers down below in the HHA reimbursable services category, the non-reimbursable services category, and the special purposes cost center. We're not gonna allocate it to all of them. We're just gonna allocate it to those cost centers that are actually used, okay? But the costs get allocated down. All the costs from lines one through eight get allocated down as we move right across this. They get accumulated over on worksheet B. I'm not showing you worksheet B. I'm just showing you this one right here. Here on worksheet B1, we identify the cost allocation statistics to be used that are germane for the cost centers whose costs are being allocated. So in column one, we're allocating the costs from line one, the capital related building and fixtures costs. And the traditional allocation statistic is square footage. We use the square footage allocation of the least owned space. And that's how we allocate those costs out to the various cost centers. Column two, we're allocating line two's costs. And we do that based on dollar value. Column three, plan operation and maintenance costs. We're allocating those costs on line three from line three. And again, we're gonna use square footage. Column four, we're identifying the costs identified in line four, transportation costs, and we're gonna use mileage. We can e either use actual mileage or we can use the mileage expense and so on. And we go, that, we go down that road to where once we get over to column eight and we get everything allocated out, it all ends up on column B, ends up in column B, column 10. And that information, those values from lines one through nine flow over to worksheet C, which we will see shortly. So here are the instructions for worksheet B1, and they're pretty significant. Uh, I'll be a questionable how much they help, but because there's a lot going on on this worksheet, but it is pretty much the same as what it's always been. The only difference being the additional cost centers that exist. But the process, how this worksheet works is exactly the same as what it's been for 40 plus years. So now we're gonna go into worksheet C. So worksheet C is where we calculate Medicare costs. Okay, so there's two parts in worksheet C. Uh, we're gonna look at part one. 
Previously, there were five parts. So they actually did simplify this a little bit. Okay, this is part one of worksheet C. So the total cost after the allocation um, that we identify in skilled nursing RN, skilled nursing LPN, those costs flow over into column 10 of this work or into column two of this worksheet. Then we put in our like-kind visits. And these are the visits that we did during the course of the year. So these are the visits from worksheet S3 part one, column eight. They go into column three above. And from that, what we have in column two and column three, we take column two, divide by column three, we get our average cost per visit by discipline. Okay, so this is the total cost per visit by discipline that everybody should need, you know, really needs to know. And you should be, you should know what this is on a month by month basis because it changes, that number really changes every moment of every day, but you should be calculating this every month after you close your books. Okay, so we have our average cost per visit. Well, then in column five, we need to put in our program visits because we're going to take our average cost per visit times the visits to get what the Medicare program costs are for that discipline. Okay, currently the instructions, if you look at the instructions, they say that this comes from Worksheet S3 Part 1. But that's incorrect because Worksheet S3 Part 1 is for the visits that were actually done during the course of the year. We use them in column three, but we shouldn't be using them in column five. The visits we should be using in column five, and this is what it's always been under PPS, is the visits for the episodes that ended during this reporting cycle, okay? The revenues that we're gonna identify on Worksheet D and Worksheet D Part 1 are gonna be for the, re the revenues for the episodes that ended. So if we're gonna compare revenues and costs, which is what Medicare margins is all about, we need to make sure that we have the proper visits. So we can't use what it says in the instructions, but I've been on the phone, email, but in talking with CMS, they did say that they have identified this, they're correcting it. The instructions don't reflect it yet, but what we're gonna do is use the visits as identified in the PSNR. And that PSNR visits are for the, vi the episodes that ended during this reporting period and it's broken down by RN, LPN, et cetera. And then we go to part two. And part two is where medical supplies, drug costs are calculated. Unfortunately, the first place that we can put anything in under total charges is generally wrong. Meaning that the ratio, which is to the right, which is total cost divided by total charges is gonna be incorrect as well. And then we take the Medicare charges that we have in the next three columns times the ratio that we previously calculated, which is more often than not incorrect, to calculate the cost of Medicare services for medical supplies, drugs, et cetera. Well, if the numbers we started out calculating with are incorrect, the numbers that we're ending up with are incorrect as well, okay? Meaning that those costs are wrong, and then this creates an issue with Medicare margins. More often than not, it, again, makes our Medicare margins look greater than what they are what they really are. And the problem begins with total charges. As most agencies no longer track or report their Medicare medical supply charges since the inception of PPS, figuring that the medical supply revenue is included as a bundled payment in the payment we receive for Medicare. That is correct, but it wasn't thought all the way through because they should have continued to track those charges. Um, but they, they said, no, we don't wanna track those charges because if we report those in our income statement, we're gonna be double counting that portion of the revenue. But that could have been easily corrected by setting up a contractual account that would have taken the inverse of whatever was in our Medicare medical supply charges. So that when you add medical supply charges, and the contra medical supply charges, it would always net to zero. And then we would know truly what our medical supply charges for the year were that we could add to our non-Medicare medical supply charges and put those in that column. But short of doing that, we're gonna have difficulty with this one. And here are the instructions. Now, and next we're gonna take a work at, look at worksheet D. Worksheet D has two parts. 
Uh, this is part one. This top part of worksheet, part one, is for the calculation of lesser reasonable costs or charges for vaccines. Hasn't changed, same as what it's been for years. Historically, not a very widely used uh, part of the worksheet, although now with the inception of COVID, I would expect that a lot more agencies are going to be providing vaccines, so to be more common soon. Here are the instructions for that. And then here's the top portion, the top portion of worksheet D part two. So an agency's episodic payments are reported on lines 10 through 13. The outlier payments are reported on lines 14 and 15. And additional payments, adjustments, et cetera, are identified on lines 16 through 27. Here are the instructions for lines 10 through 27. And this is the bottom portion. Okay, so we can have other adjustments to go in here um, that we identify in these lines, 28 through 39. Um, three things I wanna point out, sequestration adjustments, line 32, other adjustments, you know, lines 33 to 35, and total interim payments are identified here on line 36. These, line 36, this is what flows over to worksheet D1, which we will see shortly. Now about sequestration. Uh, sequestration has been in existence Medicare payments since 2013. However, the public health emergency has currently put a temporary pause on this 2% withhold applicable to Medicare. However, there currently is nothing legislated to stop the sequestration from sunsetting tonight at midnight. So legally, sequestration kicks back in tomorrow. However, there is possible help out there. Okay, there's two bills, one in the House, one in the Senate. The House bill is the one that's getting some action. That's H.R. 1868. Okay. They're both to extend the pause on sequestration. The House bill is you know, wanting to do it through 1231-21, the Senate bill through uh, the end of the PHE. So if the PHE was deemed to end on June 30th, then sequestration will kick back in on July 1st. The current status. Well, the House bill 1868 passed the House, got sent to the Senate. The Senate apparently put on an amendment to it, but it passed overwhelmingly 90 to two. But since an amendment was put back on it, they had to send it back to the House. If assuming that the House passes it again, then it's gonna to go to the president's desk. Okay, now there is a comment in the chat area that you can pull that's talking about that CMS has requested that the max temporarily hold all claims with periods beginning on after April 1 to see if Congress is going to extend the hold on sequestration. So hopefully we're going to find out about that real soon. And here are the instructions for lines 28 through 39. Now we get into worksheet D1, the interim payments. Okay, this is the top portion. The bottom portion is completed by the MAC. The information that I identified before over on worksheet D flows over here to line one. Here are the instructions. There's really no changes to this. Um, therefore, I'm not spending a lot of time. There's not a lot of changes to this worksheet either, the balance sheet. So this is lines one through 25. Here are the instructions for lines one through 10 and then 11 through 25. This is the bottom portion of the balance sheet lines 26 through 48. Again, as I said, there's really not any significant changes to this. Instructions for lines 26 to 35 and lines instructions for lines 36 to 48. Then we come to the last worksheet of our presentation, uh, worksheet F1. So this is the top portion of the income statement. And again, it's basically the same as what it was last year with one difference. And that's identified in the note below and it says now breaks out Medicare, Medicaid, and other revenues and contractuals. So you can see in lines one and two, we have to identify how much is applicable to Medicare, Medicaid, and other. Historically, we just gave a lump sum for what was our total revenues, what was our total allowances and discounts. And here are the instructions for lines one through 18. 
And then this is the second half of this income statement. Again, basically the same as what it's been. It's very simple, simplistic uh, income statement. Your income statements that you have, your P&Ls should be much more in depth than this. The one thing I did want to point out here that is a change here is line 31.5. And this is where we need to identify the COVID-19 PHE funding received by the agency. And here are the instructions for lines 19 to 33. And you can see the instructions for lines 31.5 right there. Okay, so that covers most all the changes to the Medicare Home Health Cost Report for 2020. This new version of the cost report is to be used by all agencies with a starting date on after January 1, 2020 and an ending date on after December 31, 2020. We discussed the changes to the following worksheets, S, S2, and S3, A, A6, A8, and A1, B and B1, C, D and D1, and F and F1. We looked at and discussed the specifics of these changes and what agencies can do to help in organizing their information to prepare their cost reports. I noted how the Medicare cost report is quite important and should be prepared as accurately as possible as it is used in rate setting for future periods. And that even though the majority of agencies maintain their financials on the cash basis of accounting, all cost reports with very limited exceptions must be prepared on the accrual basis of accounting. And if not, your cost report is not compliant, is subject to rejection by the MAC, a stoppage of your Medicare cash flows will result and remain in effect until it is the cost report is corrected, submitted, received, and accepted by the MAC. And there is nothing to prevent the MAC from uh, requesting additional backup information to support how you change, how you made the conversion work. And additionally, it's going to help make you stand out, which is not something you want to do in this day and age. I also just wanted to add some germane links uh, that everybody should have at their fingertips. Uh, this first one is for the HHA Center of the CMS website. So you can see all the current information that CMS has identified that's applicable to home health. These next three links are from the Provider Reimbursement Manual. This is a big part of the instructions, the regulations we have to comply with. Part one is all about determining the instructions for determining Medicare costs. And part two is all about the instructions for the Medicare cost reports. This first link is for general instructions and instructions for all different segments of the Medicare program. And this third link is for this cost report that we have been discussing. Now I'm giving you a link for MedPAC, which is the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. They send periodic reports, at least two, uh, sometimes multiple reports to Congress every year. And for the last 15 plus years, this is a group that has really been focusing on Medicare margins, particularly in home health, saying that they're, you know, in 2021, they're supposed to be 14%. In 2020, they were 17%. In 2019, they're 16%. They're, they're very high trying to get, and they've been recommending that Congress reduce our reimbursements somewhere in the five to 10% range for the last 10, 15 years. And then this last one is the Federal Register, and this is where all proposed and final rules are published. So if you want to be part of the rulemaking process, and that's a webinar for another day, um, this becomes a great starting point. So I know we went through a lot. We went through it very quickly, but I wanted to make sure we got through it all and try and build in some time to be able to answer some of your questions. So with that, I'll pass it back to Megan. And if we have any questions. Thanks, John. We do have a couple questions. Um, take a deep breath. That was a lot of great information. So I'm gonna throw a couple questions out to you. The first one is, is it best to utilize the PSNR information or your own data? We've always used the PSNR, but it may be slightly different data than our data. Uh, it's really six of one, half a dozen of the other. I would say the vast majority of the industry does use the PSNR data for identifying the information that goes on worksheet S3 part four and the information that goes on for worksheet C. 
So, but everything else, you know, it should be your own data because when you're looking at what goes in worksheet S3 part one, it should be for the actual visits that you performed this year and CMS is not gonna have that. So it's not gonna be on the PSNR. Very good. Uh, most of our staff is PRN and they do not qualify for FTE equivalent. What do I do in this situation? Well, they're, they're still FTEs. Okay, they're, they're still the hours that they work. So all the employees, all the W-2 employees, whether they're full-time or part-time, all the RN hours get lumped into one bucket. Okay, whether they're PRN, full-time, whatever. Okay, they do get included in the FTE calculation. Um, so you take that, if you have a 40 hour work week, your annual hours is 28. So you would take the total hours that were worked for all RNs, add that up, divide that sum by 2080, and then that becomes your FTE count. Okay, if, if per chance you mean with PRN, you're meaning that they're contracted individuals, same thing still applies. Okay, you would just identify that information in the second column because the first column is for staff, W-2 employees on in the FTE section. The second column is for contractors, okay, that provide these services. And you still have to log in what the total hours are. Um, generally speaking, this is not entirely all that accurate, but the rule of thumb historically has been you know, because we don't have time clocks, you know, and a significant portion of our staff work out in the field. Um, so maintaining, identifying, and record keeping, time record keeping is, is difficult at best. Um, there has been the generalization that one visit equates to one hour. But all staff get included, you know, whether they're W-2 employees, be it full-time, part-time, whatever, or contracted W or 1099 staff. All the hours get included. Excellent. John, thank you so much for such a great presentation. I know that everybody has learned so much in this uh, webinar and it's been fantastic. Wanted to remind everybody that we will be sending um, an email after the webinar with the recording and with the handout, I know a couple of you have said you've had some issues reading the handout. We'll get a, a PDF version over to you um, shortly. But John, thank you so much. I'd also like to thank Cantime for hosting today's webinar, as well as HealthRev Partners and Playmaker for sponsoring. Again, you'll be getting a recording of today's webinar, so be looking for that in your email soon. And we really thank you for joining us today, and we hope you have a great afternoon.